History was made this November, and now a record number of women will serve the U.S. Congress come January. One of those women, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, perhaps you've heard of her. She'll be representing New York's 14th Congressional District. At 29 years old, she will become the youngest serving Congresswoman ever. Joining me now is New York's own Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Democratic Congresswoman-elect. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, you, but one of the things that has been fascinating is you've been doing these, um, like, Instagram montages of, this is sort of behind the curtain. Like, this is what it's like when you come just elected. Like, this yeah. is what orientation is about. I want to show people a little bit sure, and then get your sure. sort of thinking on what you're trying to do there. Yeah, Take a listen. All right, here we go. Congressional life. Getting off to a glamorous start. See ya. What happens when you actually check into orientation? You get a swag bag. Look at that. Isn't that so cute? So I jokingly call it a swag bag, but what we actually need as elected officials is very high security data devices. So that's what's inside this bag. A new tablet and a new phone. Guys. There are secret underground tunnels between all of these government buildings. There's no special sauce to it. Um, you just got to be good at getting things done. So I've, I have found this fascinating myself. Um, what, what, what is your sort of thinking about this sort of like bringing your constituents yeah. in? Yeah, you know, I think it's so important that we humanize our government. I've kind of spoken about this before, about making it real, because a lot of times we'll tune in to cable news or we'll watch what's going on on TV, and all we're reading about is bills, and all we're reading about is legislation or, or the political dynamics. But I think it's really important that when we actually show people that government is a real thing, that it is something that you can be a part of, it's a process that we can transition into, it really kind of opens opens up the window to show that anyone can serve. And is that the sort of idea here? I you? think, you know, I, I think... If you can work a dorm uh, washing machine, yeah, <laughs> which exactly. is what that looked like. You know, I didn't, I didn't go into it with some grand strategy, right, but yeah. I think that this is really the value that I've been hearing from a lot of people to be getting from this. So one of the, uh, one of the sort of big issues right now is this leadership fight. Mm -hmm. So there are 16 House Democrats who signed a letter saying the time has come for new leadership, basically saying they won't vote for Nancy Pelosi. Mm -hmm. uh, if Ben McAdams wins in Utah, that's uh, they're one vote short of blocking her. Mm -hmm. um, where are you and how do you read this fight? Well, for me, when I when I was reading this letter that was kind of a, a release today, my main concern was that there is no vision, there is no common value, there is no goal that is really articulated in this letter aside from we need to change. And for me, what that says is, you know, I do think that we got uh, sent to Congress on a mandate to change how government works, to change uh, what government even looks like. But... Uh, if we are not on the same page about changing the systems and the values and how we're going to adapt as a party for the future, then what is the point of just changing our party leadership just for the sake of it? What I'm hearing from you is that you don't feel like there's an ideological or substantive sort of agenda-driven core of this objection. No, I mean, if anything, I think that what it does is that it creates a window where we could potentially get more conservative leadership. And when you actually look at the signatories, it is not necessarily reflective of the diversity of the party. We, you know, after, we have about 16 signatories, uh, 14 of them are male. Uh, there are very few people of color in the caucus. There are very few, there's very few ideological diversity. Yeah. It's not like there are progressives that are signing on. It's not like you have a broad-based coalition. Uh, so I, I find it, um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not totally bought into the concept. You, um, Justice Democrats, Justice Dems, which is a group that had sort of worked with your campaign early yes. on, um, you and they had sort of announced your plans to continue the process of primering incumbent Democrats, mm -hmm. which is how, of course, you got to Congress. Mm -hmm. I wonder, like, how that, how does that, color the relationships you have with the incumbents there? Well, I think what's important to articulate what Justice Democrats is about is really it's not their mission. Their mission isn't we're going to primary Democrats. Their mission is we're going to support working class candidates to run in midterm elections. And so they have supported and endorsed candidates in red to blues, in open primaries, and but they do not shy away from uh, from actual primaries in, in blue races either. And so, you know, I don't 
I don't, I'm not sure if it really changes much because incumbent Democrats support and endorse against other incumbents all the time. You had Dan Lipinski earlier this year. That's what incumbency is. That is, <laughs> That's you know, being part of the club. And so, uh, so, but you have people that also support other primary challengers to incumbents as well. Like, again, you had Dan Lipinski this year where you have Kirsten Gillibrand, you have Pramila Jayapal that came in and said, we need change in this community. So I don't think it's anything uh, too out of to to I don't think it's a departure from precedent at right. all. Uh, but I also think that we need to realize that at, at least for me and what I tell my community is that we don't once we get elected to Congress, we don't own these seats. We rent them from our communities and we have to make our case every single time. And that's not going to be I'm saying this to you as as uh, an incumbent to be. Yeah. Um, and I realize that, that 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 means I hold myself to that standard as well, but I think it makes our democracy healthy. Follow up on that. You you know, a lot of what a congressional office does, obviously, in, in a district is like Social Security disability payment wasn't mm -hmm. got held up in some logistical mm -hmm. problem, and I'm calling up my member of Congress to be like, help me out. Like, that stuff that my, my understanding is you don't have that much experience with that. Well, I mean, I, I know you worked in Ted Kennedy's office, yeah, but like, yeah. are you, how are you thinking about setting that part of this yeah. operation up? Yeah, and actually, um, the constituent services was what I did in the late Senator Kennedy's office, and that's where I really learned hmm. how important it was for us to have really robust constituent services because that is the real interaction that an everyday person has with their elected official. They say, hey, my Medicare isn't working out. Hey, my uh, my visa application for my fiance isn't, uh, is getting blocked. What can you do? And so really it, cutting through that red tape of government bureaucracy in order to serve our constituents is a huge service that we can have. And it's something that uh, we're really looking forward to building out in an innovative way. Um, your district, I think, includes or adjacent to the new proposed Amazon headquarters, right? In Long yes, Island it's City. Adjacent. It's adjacent. Um, so obviously there'll be ripple spillover effects. You've mm -hmm. been quite outspoken against it. Mm -hmm. um, do you think you can put together a political coalition to block it? Well, you know, for me, it's it's not just about me governing top down. The reason that I spoke out on this issue to begin with is because organizers and, and residents of my community were busting down our doors saying, you need to say something mm -hmm. about this because we are threatened with homelessness. We're, we're threatened with rising rents. We have seen this happen in San Francisco and Seattle. We've seen it with Foxconn, Foxconn uh, in, in the Midwest as well. Right. And so I... I, because I don't, ex because I, I did not accept any corporate lobbyist contributions in my campaign, I feel like I have the liberty to advocate directly for what the community is telling me. And if this is what the community is telling me, it's my responsibility to voice those concerns. All right. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Democratic Congresswoman elect here in New York. Come back anytime. Thanks for joining Absolutely. Thank you so much. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.